Hello everyone, thanks for joining me as we come to our time in Nehemiah. Um, we're going to move towards the end of uh, Nehemiah's stay uh, in Jerusalem after 12 years. So we're going to read from chapter 13 and there are 14 verses. So let's listen to God's word. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine and oil prescribed for the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, as well as the contribution for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil things Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain, grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and oil into the storerooms. I put Shalmiah, Shalmiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan, son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because these men were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out what I have been what do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. So we saw the walls were rebuilt. Um, and then what happened was, of course, uh, following that, a few months later, Nehemiah gathers the people together to hear the reading of the Mosaic law. And something of a spiritual revival took place, breaks out among the people. Men and women repented of their sins, long neglected religious practices uh, were revived, paying of, of tithes and giving of offerings. Um, and these were used, of course, to maintain those who were responsible for the worship that took place in the temple, the Levites, the singers, the priests. A few months later, the walls of Jerusalem were dedicated. And it was dedicated to great rejoicing, large processions, two choirs, trumpets, harps, cymbals, lyres, and, and all the people stating that they would now turn to God and obey God and serve him with all that they possessed. Now, you know, it would be wonderful to leave Nehemiah, uh, the book of Nehemiah, at that point, on this high note. Instead, we need to leave the book on a note of caution. So sometime after the dedication of the temple, Nehemiah returns to Babylon. After 12 years, as governor of Judah, he goes back to Babylon. Now, as governor of Jerusalem, he would have kept in touch with faithful men and he would have received a message of what was taking place in Jerusalem 
and it wasn't good news. So he petitioned King Xerxes, Artaxerxes, to allow him to return to Jerusalem after a year in Babylon. And the, the king gradually gives him permission. So he returns to Jerusalem and he discovers that the high priest was in cohorts with none other than Tobiah. And that the worship of God had been abandoned at the temple. You see, what had happened was that Elisha, the high priest, had now abused his office, abused his power. He had embraced Tobiah because, you see, it seems that Tobiah had become a person of stature, a person of influence. And what he had done was that he had taken uh, the, the grain and the wine and the utensils from the temple out of the rooms around the courts of the temple and he had given them over to Tobiah as a lodging. And so the wine and the grain and all that was in that room should have been used to maintain the worship in the temple by providing for the priests and the Levites so they, so they didn't have to go to work. So he clears out this room, a large room, and he brings Tobiah into the very house of God. Yes, Tobiah, the man who, you know, the Tobiah of the fame, if a fox walks on the wall, it's going to fall. That Tobiah, you know, the man who was seeking the life of Nehemiah, he brings him in, into the temple, into the heart of the temple. Now, Nehemiah had earlier made it clear to Tobiah that he had no part in the people of God, no part in Jerusalem, no portion. And yet here he is, as large as life, desecrating the temple with his presence, abusing the things which belong to God. And the high priest supports him. And we need to ask, why, why is this? Now, as I said, Tobiah become a man of influence. You'll see that at the end of chapter 6. And we're told that many of the people of, of the nobles of Judah were under oath to him. Now, we're not told why. But it would appear that Tobiah was also married to a Jewess, the daughter of Shechaniah, a priest who was possibly related to Eliashib. And we know also that Eliashib's grandson was married to the daughter of, yeah, Sanballat. How does this happen? So the enemies of God's people, those who are implacably opposed to God and his people, have power and influence at the very heart of the religious life of the nation. How does this happen? And the high, the high priest is in his pocket. And what is interesting is that this initial wave of religious zeal seems to have died out. The people initially obeyed the law of Moses. You'll read of that in 13 verses 1 to 3. What they did was they discovered that the Ammonites should not be there. The Moabites should not be among the people. So they cleared them out for the treachery which they committed a thousand years before to the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. You read of that in Numbers 22 um, to, first, uh, to chapter 24. Tobiah was an Ammonite. It should have been uprooted and sent packing from Jerusalem. But men of influence, the high priests, the nobles, disobeyed God's word, made excuses, compromised. You know the kind of thing. You know, surely that law forbidding them to be part of us, surely that's from a previous generation. We can, we can throw that one out. You know, let's live and, you know, let live. Um, we need to bring the, the laws of God up to date, you know, make it more relevant for today. That kind of thing. And the result was, of course, that there was a snake at the heart of the nation's spiritual life, corrupting it, influencing and defiling the temple, bringing the worship of God to a standstill. The priests were not being paid or supported by the tithes and offerings. Uh, these were taken and used by the high priest for his own 
his own selfish gain. And so the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers, the doorkeepers, had to go back to work. They had to go back to their fields. And so worship of God came to an end. And this corruption influ influenced every aspect of the life of the nation. And so Nehemiah arrives, and I love the understatement. I was greatly displeased, he said. The understatement of countless millennia, incandescent, angry. Angry that God's people had no access to worship. Angry that God's laws had been broken and disobeyed. Angry that Elisha had failed to be the shepherd of God's people. He became a wolf. Angry that the revival of God's people had not been deeper and more lasting. And so he took action. He marched into the rooms allocated to the buyer and threw them out. He, everything he possessed. He could do this because he was the governor of Jerusalem with the backing of the king. And he had the rooms purified and he restored them to their original use. A mini cleansing of the temple. Now, I wonder if you think his actions were somewhat radical. But let me say this. Sin, sin never encourages or cultivates spiritual growth. Sin is always destructive. And when left unchallenged, when accommodated, sin will seriously damage any church fellowship, the life of any Christian. It must be dealt with seriously, radically. Throw it out, everything, including the kitchen sink. Now, if you think that's too radical, too uncompromising, then we need to ask, why did Jesus, the Son of God, have to die for our sin? You see, Nehemiah dealt with the sin and he restored the relationship in worship. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you and I need to deal with the sins in our lives to know again the joy of restored fellowship, the joy of worshipping God. Deal with sin. Deal with it radically. Let us pray. So we come, our Father, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for Nehemiah. We thank you for his commitment to your glory and to your people. Help us, we pray you, to look at our hearts and to root out and throw out anything that would hinder your glory and your work and your worship in our lives, for Jesus' sake.